the worship of God publicly. And here are the three things he covers right off the bat and tries to correct. One is giving, one is praying, and one is fasting. And he says there's a great amount of abuse given to these three avenues of worship that has to be corrected among believers. And he establishes what the cause of it is, why there is so, much, so many problems with giving, praying, and fasting in public. Now, remember, Jesus is teaching to the Jewish age in Matthew 6, and his, his congregation, our Jewish Old Covenant, carried only the Old Testament with him. But notice what he, he puts his finger on in all three areas in verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness, demonstrating, demonstrated publicly your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. They were, they, they were on the right track but running the wrong course. It's like a distance guy coming out for the 100-yard dash. I mean, it just doesn't work. Notice what he says now, and then he's going to deal, if you read on, he's going to give a warning against giving, against praying, and against fasting. Now, I want you to drop down to praying, because out of these three things, he only pulls one out to give a model, and this is called the model prayer. Now, it begins in verse 5, it begins in verse 5, and it's going, to go, it's going to go on to 15. I'm only going to take a section of it, but I want to introduce it to you. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites. And he's going to say that about giving. He's going to say it about praying. He's going to say it about fasting. And what is it? It's demonstrating your righteousness before other people. Be careful how you demonstrate the righteousness of God from your life to other people. Don't do it for show. Do it for tell. Uh, try to introduce them to your heavenly Father in a positive spiritual way. So he says, I don't want you to be hypocrites. And then he talks about that in the, how they stood in the synagogues on the street corners and how they wore their garments and yada, yada, yada. And then he gets down into verse 9. He's been talking about prayer, and he's going to continue, but he's going to stop and give a model for prayer. And remember, this is public. He says, pray then in this way. And you're familiar with this. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Holiness, my connection with your holiness is why I pray. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This word of God, the word takes us to the will, and the will takes us to the work in that order. And the work we do on earth has been established in heaven and should have a heavenly context and response. Then he says, Give us this day our daily bread. In other words, taking care of our logistical needs, like Philippians 4.19 in the New Testament. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Then he goes on to talk a little bit more in verses 14 and 15 about the idea of forgiveness. The debt and forgiveness. The debt and forgiveness. And he, he explains a little more that he's not talking 
in, in necessarily legal terms about debt, but rather spiritual. And so this Father's Day that's coming, I feel our greatest tribute ought to be to our Heavenly Father. While our earthly father is important, and we'll certainly, those who have that, our earthly father still with us, will pay a special attention to that. But who has, who has substituted that in the Christian life in a most miraculous way is God our Father. Our Father who is in heaven, take care of me on earth. And listen, he's more than willing to do that, is he not? This Father's Day, as we come, if you have a father, pay tribute. Honor that position he holds in your life. Not necessarily the character of the person, but the position that God has put over your life. And you ought to, each Father's Day, spend a little time with your father and recognize some of the positive things that he has given you that have carried your life forward. Often, I think, we just kind of think of the negative things that have not carried our life anywhere but backwards. But he wants you to have a positive influence, is the point he's saying, with other people. Let, let the light of Christ in your life, that light from God through Christ shine to other people this Father's Day. Now, having said that, Let's go to 1 Corinthians. We're going to take a look at the Eucharist. We're going to do that first. We're going to the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians 11. If you picked up a study, if you picked up a bulletin, then inside the bulletin is a guide for you to properly take part in the Eucharist. The, some people call it communion. Some people call it Lord's Supper. We call it Eucharist because of the words giving thanks in the Greek language is Eucharist. It's where you get the word Eucharist. And so many in the church, because they know the Greek language, refer to it as the Eucharist. Well, here we are in verse 23. We're going to read through it, then we're going to talk about it, then we're going to take part in it. Yeah, everybody, before we start, does everybody have, did everybody have, does everybody have one of these little cups? If you don't lift your hand, we'll get it for you. We got a couple up front. I should have done that myself, but I didn't. Willie and Tyler are with us today. You'll meet them. You've met Willie. Well, Tyler's been here. Tyler's not a stranger. Come one time, we own you. We take, we take possession. All right, thank you. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23, Paul, Paul inter, introduces the subject of the Eucharist uh, as a special revelation to him. I received from the Lord, that, that's one of Paul's, if you study Paul's writings, you're going to find he uses this phrase a lot, and it's a reference to special revelation. You'll see it, I believe you'll see it in my, in my text study today uh, of the rapture of the church. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. See, that's, isn't that the pattern? We receive the word from the Lord. We understand it. We believe it. And then we share it with others, right? Isn't that the system? That's a Christian way, man, right there. I received from the Lord which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, and the word that, you always watch that. In the Greek language, if that's hote, that's a declarative of a doctrinal principle or lesson. That the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And then he describes the bread this way. And when he had given thanks, he's talking about the last, what he called the last supper, which was the last Passover. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body which is for you, do this remember me. Now look, do you suppose that's symbolism? <laughs> well, not everybody's going to go up and take a bite of his flesh and eat it. This is my body, which is for you, do this remember to me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, and he said, this cup is the new covenant. 
Now, the cup he was holding was the old covenant of shadow Christology of the blood of Christ through the lamb. The lamb has come, and now the blood's important. You got that? This cup is a new covenant in my blood. My body and now my blood. Do this as often as drink it, remembrance of me. That's the two elements and the importance of them. Then he says, for as often as you. That means as often as you. Around here we offer uh, every first Sunday as a rule. The first Sunday in July, we will not do the Eucharist. We'll do it the second Sunday because we're going to do, uh, we'll be meeting in the new church and the facility there, and we're going to, we're going to have a 4th of July celebration. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Isn't that powerful? Listen to this now. As often as you eat the, bre- the Eucharist, the bread and the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he what? Comes. I mean, we call that second coming. And the Eucharist, the most important ordinance of the church, sets between the first coming and the second coming. And you have to be in assembly. Like Hebrews 10, 25, you have to be in assembly to do it like they were, the Corinthians. Therefore, whoever eats, therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Now, listen, what's important is to not take part in an unworthy manner. What possibly could that mean? Here's what it means. With these are this only people who participate in the Eucharist are believers, those who believe that Christ died for their sins, was buried, and raised on the dead third day. That's his that's the work of his body in death and in resurrection and his blood that makes that whole mission important to God. The redemptive program unworthy manner is for a believer who has accepted that Christ bore our sins on his body on the tree gave up his own life blood went to Sheol and raised from the dead to secure our salvation by grace through faith and not of herself as a gift an unworthy manner would be a believer with sinful, with willful sin in their life who won't confess and think they can take part in the Eucharist without discipline. Don't do that. He warns you against that. Verse 29. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not, if he does not judge the body rightly. Listen, he's going to come back in a moment and explain that as divine discipline to a Christian. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick. He's talking about believers who chose to go against the word of God, take part in the Eucharist with willful sin in their life, willful personal sin. He says, I'm going to discipline you. You'll become weak. You'll become sick and a number sleep. That's a euphemism for death. We'll see it today in another passage on our study. If we judge ourselves rightly, how are we going to do that? 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's talking to Christians, God is faithful and just through Jesus Christ, our Savior, to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sins through your own priesthood, 1 Peter 2, through your own priesthood, we're all believer priests in the church age under the, under the office of the priesthood of Jesus, Jesus Christ. And we have a responsibility to confess sin, especially in, a, in a, an important uh, uh, church meeting time of the Eucharist. So he goes on. 
If we judge ourselves rightly, we, we, will not, we would not be judged. When we are judged, here it is. This is that part of weak, sick, and sleep. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord. That takes us to Hebrews, the 12th chapter, 5 through 11. Divine discipline. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. Listen, if you're, Ill, if you're an illegitimate child, in other words, you're religious but not saved, you're, ju you're under judgment. But if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and you have sin in your life, you are disciplined out of the love of God because he's your father. He disciplines you as a father, not as a judge. So then, my brethren, when you come together, and then he talks about it. He talks about fellowship in verse 31. Well, let's go ahead. Let's go back. And let me restate, and then we're going to take part in the bread. When he had given thanks, that word is where you get Eucharist. The word giving thanks, Eucharisco is where you get the word Eucharist. That's why we call it the Eucharist. It's okay to call it communion. Some people call it the Lord's Supper. These are all good names. We just call it that for that reason. He broke it. He broke the bread. Notice he breaks the bread and he drinks the cup. He broke the bread and he said, this is my body, which is for you in remembrance of me. Now, see that word remembrance? Let me ask you this. Could be a gate question, a pearly gate question. When you get there, he's going to say, is Jake part of the Eucharist? Yes. Your pastor will tell you the word remember. You're supposed to remember specific doctrines about the body of Christ that bore your sins? Yes. Did you remember when you took part in the Eucharist? Probably. Then repeat them, repeat them and we'll... You know, now, he's going to let you in anyhow. All right. Because of grace, not because of works. <laughs> You'd be left out in the rain, wouldn't you? Or in the cold. So what does, what does, the, what does the bread or the body of Christ re represent that bore our sins to satisfy the wrath of God, the justice of and satisfy the judgment of God upon our life. Huh? Virgin, virgin birth. Virgin birth. Born outside the slave market of Adam's sin. Hmm? Impeccability. Lived 30 some years without sin. Not 30 minutes. How about 30 years? 33. And qualifies him to go to the cross to bear the sins and shed his blood. Hypostatic union. This man, Jesus Christ, who walked on earth, was 100% God and 100% man. In, in theology, we call it hypostatic union. 100% God and 100% man in one human form. Nobody like him. He's the unique man of the universe. That's why he's the only begotten son of God. Only begotten son of God. The rest of us are adopted as sons of God. Born illegitimate Adopted legitimate. What else we have? The celebrity ship of Jesus Christ. He dies on a cross. He's buried. He was raised from the dead. Forty days later, he goes back to the Father, seated at the right hand of God the Father, and everything that he is, we become. He's a son, we're a son. He's eternal life, we're eternal life. He's a priest, we're a priest. He's an heir, we're an heir. The inheritance he has has become ours. And the list goes on. He's peace, we're peace. 
It's in your list under celebrity ship. Seated at the right hand of God the Father. You realize, seated at the right hand of God, that everything that he represents for the church, he's the head and savior of the body, applies to us dispensationally. Just think about that. When you see the things that Jesus Christ did on earth to establish the church, we share in that every aspect of it in our dispensation. And Paul writes enormously on this subject. <laughs> he writes, in, that's why we have theology of the church, because Paul was overwhelmed by the fact that we share in the sonship of Jesus Christ, seated at the right hand of God the Father, who is the head of the church and the savior of the body, and we participate with him in this gigantic movement of the gospel across the world for generations. It's a pretty phenomenal idea. So there's the body. Let's, let's, get it. let's see if we can get to that bread. Can you get to that on the top of that thing? Let's hold it. And remember what we're going to do. With our, when we put this in our mouth, our brain is going to work, Right? We're going to remembrance, right? Okay, here we go. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Isn't that powerful? Let me have prayer over that. Father, we're so thankful today that Jesus Christ was, as the Son of God, perfect in every way. Not just in the way we think as human beings what would be perfect, but even in the divine scheme, what would be perfect in the divine realm is just way beyond what we could imagine. But we are so thankful that it was given to us on the basis of grace through faith and not of ourselves. It is a gift, not of works. We're so thankful today, Father, for your great plan. Who would have ever thought about a virgin birth after Adam's sin? Who would have ever thought of that before the foundation of the world? Nothing but a, a phenomenal God that is omniscient and sovereign in his will. How we thank you today for giving us your only born son that we might become one. And may it set upon our heart this Father's Day that you are the father of fathers. You are what give fathers a good name. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Then he goes on and he takes the cup. So let's take that cup. Let's pop that lid. Boy, that thing is tough. There it goes. <clears throat> Everybody got that? Did you pop your lid? Let's take that. And you know to put remembrance. <clears throat> he reminds us this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Oh, Lord Jesus, how we remember you. <clears throat> Not as one who walked the earth, but we found you at Calvary. We found you at Golgotha. I found you at the age of 21. I found you at the cross willing to kneel, surrender my life to the fact that you died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day to give me life, not just eternal, but abundant. I bring my heart to you today, Father, and tell you what a th how thankful I am. And I tell you, Lord Jesus, how thankful I am that you surrendered it 
When we sing that song, I surrender all, we have no idea what all you surrendered and what little we did in comparison. But how thankful we are for that work of Christ on the cross. Lord Jesus, we couldn't begin to thank you enough. What you have meant to my life and to others by your sacrifices you've made on our behalf is just is just enormous. So we thank you for it today. We thank you, Father, for your wonderful word and the fulfillment. You are so faithful. You are faithful to do what you promise. And we're reminded this Eucharist of that fact in our life in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, people, if you'll turn in your Bibles with me to 1 Thessalonians. It's the book of our study. And we're in the fourth chapter. Remember one of the unique things about the book of 1 Thessalonians One factor in it is that Paul could only stay with them three weeks and get ran out of town for preaching the gospel, Paul. And he's concerned about their well-being spiritually because he had a very little time with them. And they have apparently written to him and talked about some things, and he and and listen, they were already doing great things and had a reputation about their work for the Lord. Very evangelical. Uh, they were making, they were they were causing an awareness in uh, what we would call Greece uh, in Macedonia and Archaea. They were all already making a splash. Uh, there, the, the presence of the gospel, of the grace gospel of salvation was being carried forward by them a, a, in evangelism of ministering their region, just like we always think. We're, we're headed to next month. We'll be in, in Sinclair County uh, at, in, a, uh, in Moody, and we're excited about that. We're ex- and listen, we're not just looking for Moody. We're looking for Sinclair County. We claim Sinclair County for Christ. We're just going out there to, you know, set up shop someplace. We want to be, we want to be strong and evangelical and, and, and teach the people the truth of the Word of God. We want to see people get saved and, 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 and families brought into the kingdom and all that type of thing. This little church was doing it. They, they, had, they were running on fumes doctrinally, but what they knew they did, what they knew they, they did. And they were, they, were, they, were, they were just storming away throughout uh, what we would call Greece today. And, and so Paul is writing back. Well, one of the things that's interesting about 1 Thessalonians is that every chapter ends with an eschatology doctrinal principle. Eschatology is second coming. The study of the second coming. Every chapter ends with an eschatology doctrinal point. Now, when you get to chapter 4, he extends the length of it. It's the longest dissertation in the book on the second coming. Remember, every chapter has something to say about the second coming of Christ. In fact, for Paul, the, the eminence of the return of Jesus Christ is what... Paul felt kept, kept Christians alert in their daily living. The problems they were going through, it's okay, the Lord's coming. Uh, their, their work, and that's all right, the Lord's coming. He kept the Lord's coming, the eminence of the return of Christ, any day, at any second, at any moment, but boom, before his people on their daily life. I find that to be really interesting. Because for a lot of people, they don't think about the second coming as an important doctrine for their present life. And yet for Paul, it was because every chapter he wrote on it, he ended, the Lord is coming. 
second chapter, the Lord is coming. He always gave you a new idea about the Lord is coming. I just find that interesting. Now, when he gets to chapter 4, starting with verse 13 and going through 18, he gets into this subject pretty heavy. We call it the rapture of the church. Uh, Paul referred, it to, referred to it as being caught up in verse 16. Look at verse 16 for just a moment. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Verse seven, 17, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. That word caught up together is harpazo, H-A-R-P-O-Z-O. -O. That's harpazo. It means, to be, it means to be snatched or seized from some kind of situation that is, uh, rescues you. You're in, uh, you're in the clutches of something that's enormously dangerous, and all of a sudden, you're snatched out of it, you're seized away from it, and rescued. Our Tuesday night study, we've been studying uh, the days of Noah, so that we could get a good understanding about how the last days would be of the sons of, of the Son of Man. And we found that happen with them. The believers were put in the ark, and everybody outside the ark, the unbelievers, were destroyed by divine judgment. That, that would be a concept. They were seized and caught up when the Lord, he built, Noah built the ark, and then one day God says, okay, board the ark. There was no, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Board the ark, we're sailing. And so immediately everybody, the animals were already in, and all the food was on, and one day God says, now. And they enter the ark, God shuts the door, it rains 40 days and 40 nights, water coming up out of the earth and water coming on top of the earth, and it's a cataclysmic flood. It worldwide. It, it changed the post-Diluvian world. It changed the geography of our world. You and I live in the post-Diluvian period. It changed our world. It went from two continents to seven. You know, yeah, we've talked about it. It's, it was an enormous thing. You know what, God, listen, God takes care of his people. God takes care of believers. He's your father. He takes care of you. You've got to know that. You've got to really believe that in your heart. There's nobody in this whole wide world cares more about you in every aspect of your life than God, your father. You've got to understand that. Well, <clears throat> that word caught up, harpazo in the Greek, that was Paul's idea that's the idea of rapture. Where did you get the word rapture? R-A-P-T-U-R-E? It's Latin. It came from Latin theology. I've told this story many times. Rick Hughes and I were driving back from a, a, a missionary program. We had the radio on a, on a church program, and the guy said, I don't remember now how much money. The farther, farther I get from the story, the money <laughs> changes because it wasn't important. But it, for us, going home, it was a lot of money. I don't know what. It could have been $10. It would have, <laughs> have been a lot of money. If anybody can prove to me from the word of God that the rapture exists, holy, f we was all over that deal. Give me the money. And we started popping on that. We, we called it. We, st we stopped. We didn't have cell phones that day. We, we stopped and got him on the horn on the radio and began to feed him the word of God and said, we'll be down to get our money. We're not too far from where we were going, somewhere in Mississippi. We're not too far from you. We'll do a U-turn and go back and get our money. And he wouldn't give it to us. And it was all over the word rapture. And we tried to tell him and show him 
that the word was transliterated from the Greek to the Latin. Jeez. So we didn't get our money. You know, so, and, and a great lesson, you can win an argument <laughs> and not win any money. Remember that next time you get in an argument with somebody. Remember all that. Well, here we are. Let's take a look at verses 13. Uh, hey, John, when it comes time for, for us to take a break, just give me a high, high signal, will you? A little thing like this. How much time have I got, John? I got 20 minutes. Boy, I'll bust through this thing. Then we'll take a break and have a cup of coffee. You'll need it. If not, I will. <laughs> Let me look at, today I want to look at five things. This, this, listen, I'm going to teach on this three times. I, I, I'm going to teach f three weeks on this. I'm going to teach today. This is my first, part one. Paul opened the lesson text with three reasons for writing this lengthy eschatology doctrine on the rapture of the church. He does it in verse 13 and 18. He opens and closes. Three reasons. First reason, he says, we, the missionary team, we do not want, ook's a strong negative. When you say O-U-K, it's a strong negative. That's like this. Listen, look. No! It's not one of these. No, we shouldn't do it. No. It's not one of those. We do not want you to be uninformed. Look at your Greek word. See the A on the front of the word, A-G-N-O-E-O? -E Watch this now. That A on the front is an alpha privative in the Greek language. It means without. And the other word, G-N-O-E-O, -E is the verbal form of gnosis, the word knowledge. The word ignorant means to without, without knowledge of the word of God. You can be ignorant on a lot of subjects because you're without knowledge of what God says about it. Only you can change that in your life. Only you can change that in your life. Paul says, we do not want you to be uninformed. That's why we teach the way we teach. Because we don't want you to be, there's no reason to sit in a church like this and ever be, ever be ignorant of the word of God. You might sit in one that would lead that way, but not this one. It means to be without the knowledge of the truth from the word of God. Listen, people miss this. I want to show you something. Look up here. You can write later. The Holy Spirit won't let you forget anything that's important. John, the 15th chapter. Look. God wants you to know the truth. John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and a what? Life. These are not the same thing. They are three different. Would you agree with that? He's talking about three different things. But they come from the same thing. Listen to me now. You're missing this. They, all three of these things, what's one? Jesus said, I am the way to, say it this way, I, I am the way, say it, say it that way now, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. You see, you miss the I am. What, listen, truth is about a person, Right? Come on now. We, do I mean, listen, it's not first grade, but I can be first grade with you. 
He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. You don't have truth until you have Christ. If you have Christ, you have access to all the truth. You understand that? Where are you going to get it? You're going to get it from the word of truth. Here's another one. John 8, 32. You shall know the truth, and the truth of what? Set you free. But see, the truth is truth about the person of Jesus Christ. I am the truth. And that truth, if you will study it, if you will study my life and my teachings, will set you free from the cosmic system of the lies of the devil. <laughs> is he not the arch enemy of truth? Yeah, he's called the liar of liars. Pants on fires. Right? All right, come on now. So he says, we do not want you to be ignorant or uninformed. Brethren, that's the family. Second reason, verse 13, about those who are asleep. Who are these people? They must go to my church. N not you, of course. About those who are asleep, these are talking about deceased church age brethren. Agreed? Of course. So that, now watch this now. That's Hina, watch this now. That's Hina with a subjunctive over here, which means in the Greek language, setting up divine purpose. In other words, about those who are asleep, so that you, there, here's a divine principle for you about those, those church age believers who have died. Church age believers who have died, I've got a word for you from the Lord. That you, the living church age believers, who have got someone up there with the Lord today, will not grieve somebody that you as a church age believer have loved and been with in church, in family, in community, who another believer has died. I've got a word for you. That you will not grieve as an adverb of comparison, as do the rest unbelievers, who have no hope in life or death. No hope. That's the second reason he writes. Second reason he writes on eschatology in a lengthy way. He's saying, he gives you three reasons why he's writing a lengthy dissertation on the rapture of the church. The importance to the one who is deceased and the importance of the church to the one who is still alive. <clears throat> and we've all got somebody there, haven't we? Huh? Some of us got a little closer in time and persons and... Right? They, you do not grieve. You do not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. He gives a third reason in verse 18. He summarizes. He does the most interesting Greek. I tell you, Paul is a master of the Greek language. Usually when you see the word therefore in the English, normally it's un, O-U-N. And it's just drawing a conclusion. That's not the word here. I wrote it on your paper because it is so unusual. It's hoste plus the imperative. That's a Greek, that's a, in the Greek language, a command. This word, therefore, is a much stronger word. He uses this, this idea here. It's a conjunction with an imperative bringing out a very strong conclusion. A very strong conclusion 
that's necessary for your life. When he says this, he's saying to the Thessalonians, really, that, what I'm telling you, and that's verse 18, what I'm telling you about the Eucharist in every chapter and now summarized in a very strong way, I'm telling you something that's really important to your life. This really bothered them that they had lost believers before the second coming of Christ. They, 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 Paul had pressed them so hard on live your life in the expectancy. When you put your head on the pillow overnight, you should be content with your life that you lived it as if Christ was coming today. Now he's got, he, he, he's maybe oversell or overkill or what we might say. They're, they're a little concerned about that. Well, what about these people have gone on? I'm still here. What is the deal with them and us? How does this, how does this work? And so he's, he comes to a, he, now when we get to 18, he's already laid out 13, 14, 15, 17, which I'm about to do. I'm just showing you the reasons he wrote it. But he comes to a very strong conclusion theologically when he says, therefore, comfort what, isn't that something? That takes you to 2 Corinthians 1. Write that on your paper and later today read it about comfort. That's a great passage on comfort. You see, they're troubled. They're troubled about, well, what about the people who have died and the Lord hasn't come and I'm, I'm here? And what is their state and my state? And how is this whole thing? How, how is the second coming? What are they doing and what's their state? And how is this all going to come together? And, he, and he, he wants them to not to grieve and he wants to, com he wants to comfort them and he wants them to understand the importance of comforting other people with the answers to this. Right? He used two key words. Listen, the word grieve and comfort. You understand that? What's necessary? And so he, he does this in verse 18 with a divine purpose about those who are asleep so that you not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. And then he, that's in verse 13. Then he concludes by saying, therefore, right, comfort, he puts in the imperative. That's a command. That, this makes this a strong conclusion. Therefore, comfort one another with With is a good translation of the word in plus the instrumental because it it's, it's, it's carries the idea of means. Comfort is what is necessary for grieving. And if you want to know how that works from God's side to your side, read 2 Corinthians 1. Paul laid it out. He laid this. He laid this whole thing out. How comfort works in times of grief. And it, listen, it could be over the loss of a loved one, or a job, or a health. You know, you can grieve about a lot of things, can't you? Comfort is the answer to grief. Comfort is the answer to grief. Comfort. Comfort one another with, with these words. Comfort comes from these words. What are these words? Categorical Bible doctrine. Categorical. I put it in the plural, Bubba. It's categorical doctrine. What categories do you teach on? Second coming of Christ. It's always about categorical doctrine. Categorical doctrine is what gives you information on the theology of a subject matter from the, the uh, omniscience of God. What does God say on such and such a subject? Paul lays it out. We call it categorical doctrine. Other people call it systematic theology. Once you begin to teach a church, the systematic theology has to be reduced to categorical thinking. Point number two. Uh, koimeo is the Greek word for the word sleep. I want you to notice verse 13, 14, and 15. Notice it's used so that uh, 
brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as those who do, as do the rest who have no hope. Then he, in verse 14, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, that's a first-class condition. Is that word if? In the English, it just says if. But in the Greek, there are four different ways to look at that word if. This is the first class, and it means it's true. Th this is what it means. If it's true in the if part, we, we call it the protasis. If it's true in the if part, then it's true in the then part, if then. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we do, it's essential to our salvation. Even so, that's the then part. Even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Verse 15. I'm just after the word asleep. <clears throat> For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. That's special, that's special divine revelation. Remember I said that? That's the way he opened up the Eucharist. He does, this is a, a way that Paul introduces uh, a special divine revelation. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Now we know he's talking about believers, church age believers who have died since... The beginning of the church, Jesus seated at the right hand of God the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit of Pentecost. The church age begins. He says, we, we, we know that we, and they, they have experienced, they, even some uh, in the short time since Paul was there and evangelized, apparently. So the, the word asleep, but what does that mean? These are people who, these are believers who have died and gone to be with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5, 6, 7, and 8, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord, who is seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. So the idea is, what does that mean? What, and what is that state that they're in called asleep? Remember, he used it in our, in our Eucharist passage, remember? Many of you will become weak, sick, and what? Sleep. That's a euphemism uh, for a believer dying and going to be, be with the Lord. To be absent from the bodies to be, is to be present. First, 2 Corinthians 5, 6, 7, and 8. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now, what Paul called that to those who are alive, for those who are alive, Paul called that asleep in Christ, asleep in Jesus. We know they're present with him, but what does that mean? Listen to me. It refers to the body, not the soul and not the spirit. That's the whole part about the second resurrection. In the, in the, when Jesus comes back, we're going to be caught up to be alive with him in the air. We're going to receive our resurrection body without experiencing death. Airborne. Amen. That's right. There's an airborne. Those who, those who are already asleep in the Lord, that's a euphemism for their body. It's a euphemism. They're going to come back with the Lord. They're coming back with the Lord. We're going to meet them in the air. They're going to, they're going to get their resurrection body before we get ours. Listen to this. Verse 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede. What's he talking about, precede? He's talking about the resurrection body. We will not get our resurrection before them. See, they're concerned about, well, what about these people? The only thing that's asleep in heaven is no body. Their soul isn't, and their spirit isn't. We learned that from Jesus when he went to Sheol. We learned that from Luke 16, the rich man and Lazarus. Well, 
For the Lord himself will descend from, watch this, the Lord will, I'm at verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a voice, with a shout, and the voice of an archangel, and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ. A moment ago they were asleep in Christ, now they're dead in Christ. Right? right. So are you. <laughs> Galatians 2.20. I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, not I who live, but Christ lives in me. Well, anyhow, trump of God and the dead in Christ will what? What's it say? No, no. I'm in verse 16. What's the last part of that? Dead in Christ will what? Will rise first. Now, see, first they said precede. Did he say precede? Now rise first. What, what is that a reference to? It's resurrection body, right? Yes. <laughs> of course that's what that means. Now here's what it means. When Christ comes, he's going to bring all the church age believers with him, right? It's church age. He's the head of the church. He's coming back for the church, right? What's Jesus coming for the, from the earth? He's coming back for the church, right? We who are alive and remain. <laughs> he's coming back. With all of the church age believers. Right? When they come back, they're going to have their resurrection bodies. And we're going to be caught up together with them. And we will receive our resurrection body so that in the cloud, in the air, we will all have our resurrection bodies. Hello, church. So what a sleep is a reference to is not the soul. You know, man is trichotomous, right? 1 Thessalonians 5.23, man is trichotomous. He has a body, soul, and spirit. Where does body come from? Where does man body? Where, what's the origin of, uh, he's from the dust of the ground. And when he dies, he goes back to it. His body goes back to it, greed. Well, somewhere in your paper is Genesis 2-7 and Genesis 3-19 that tell you that. I mean, right out of the original story. <clears throat> At death, the body goes back to the dust from which it came. Well, there it is. <clears throat> I gave you three passages that, and the soul and the spirit return back to the Father who gave them. Job 34, 15, uh, 14 and 15. You see, and in, in the origin of man, where did man come from? Originally, he came from the God, God formed, he took the dust of the earth and formed man's body. Then he, Nishima Haimed, he breathed the breath of God into the nostrils and they became a living soul. Nishima Haim. My, my. <clears throat> One of the, as soon as I get through with 1 Thessalonians, I should be out, we should be pretty close to out. One of the th first things I'm going to do out. In St. Clair, thank you. St. Clair County, not Sinclair. In St. Clair County, one of the first things I'm going to do is I'm going to teach on the creation story of Genesis and try to clear up so much confusion about it. Uh, God forms man out of the dust of the earth. He, he Nisha Mahaim, he breathes the breath of lives, uh, plural. Haim is plural in Hebrew. Guys going through the Hebrew class will, are learning all this. <clears throat> and and what, what, what we got is a body, but we don't have, it's not alive. It's in a rest position. And God breathed the life into it. Soul life and spirit life into the body. <clears throat> the body stands up and, and uh, probably cries, right? I don't know. <laughs> That's what they, and that, is that, is that, I got me a doctor in the, in the house. The, you know, it used to be slap the baby till it cried. That, you don't do that anymore, do you? No. Sometimes? <laughs> I, I don't know. It, but you can't do it when they're adults. Don't do it when they're adults. Okay. The soul of the old covenant believers went to Sheol, a place called paradise in a Gentile term, and Abraham's bosom in a Jewish term. You can read about that in Luke 16. 
and to await the first resurrection, beginning with Jesus Christ, the first fruits of the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 22, which is where our subject matter goes back to out of 1 Thessalonians 4. And Revelation, you ought to read this later, Revelation, the 20th chapter, verses 4 through 6, which is talking about the first resurrection, which is dispensational resurrections. First resurrection. The first resurrection, there's two. The first resurrection is for believers dispensationally. And 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23 explain that. So what we have in the idea of a sleep is a body idea of trichotomy. And so when the Lord returns, the soul and the spirit is still under Nisha Mahaim, but it's got to be infused into a resurrection body. They'll come back, they'll get their resurrection body, and then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. We will receive our resurrection body without experiencing death. I mean, that's beyond my pay grade. I begin to know what that means. Point number three. The church age gospel, which we call the historical gospel because the gospel in the Old Covenant was called shadow Christology. The gospel in the New Testament is historical Christology. In the Old Testament, Jesus was coming and was going to die on a cross, be buried, and raised from the dead. Galatians 3.8, that's how Abraham got saved. That's how everybody got saved. In the New Testament, we, we, we identify it historically. <clears throat> in Jerusalem, place on a map. A hill called Golgotha, we call it in Latin, Calvary, Golgotha. In Latin, it's called Calvary. Try to explain to that guy on the phone. What do you think about Jesus died at Calvary? Yeah, well, that's Latin. But he didn't, he didn't, in his Bible, that was okay. Church age plays an important theological role in Paul's discussion of the rapture of the church in 1 Thessalonians, our passage for 13 through 18. And I explained it as I read it earlier. For if, that's, that's the Protestant part. If that's true, then the then part is true. I explained that earlier to you. I'll tell you what you should pay attention to is what he said was true and is necessary for the believer to know. Listen to what he said. If, and, that's, and this is true in the Protestants, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, that's how we get in, as a believer, that's how we get involved in the second coming of Christ. <clears throat> because we believe that the gospel is that Jesus died, was buried, and raised from the dead the third day, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. He says it here. If, he, if, if it's not true in the Protestants, it's not true in the Apotheosis. The first class condition in the Greek language means if it's true in the if, it's true in the then. And it's got to be true in the then because it has to be true in the if. My, my, my. I'm just trying to tell them, Paul. I'm just trying to tell them. <clears throat> if we believe, present active and negative, Jesus died and rose again, even so, that's the, now we're in the apotheosis, then this is true. Even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in the, dia plus the ablative in the Greek language means an agent. I got my life insurance from an agent that sells life insurance. Life insurance in the Bible the agent is Jesus Christ. You believe in Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. You got it from that day forever because it's eternal, and the only body can give it to you is eternal. God gives it to Christ, Christ gives it to you. Boy, boy, you write this down. 1 John 5, 11 through 13. Man, you got to get this stuff. I mean, this is milk stuff. I, I, I haven't taught anything that's not milk today. Everything I've taught today is milk. <clears throat> All right, doctrinally. 
Now, notice on my paper at point number three, dia plus the ablative of agent. In Jesus, let's say, they have fallen asleep in Jesus. <clears throat> dia plus the ablative in Jesus. Dia plus the ablative it refers to the mechanics of the gospel of Jesus Christ to those believe that he died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. These are the ones we're talking about who are in heaven. You're not going to get to heaven without it. If that's true, then this is true. If it's true that on earth they believe that Jesus died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, they're die, they're going to go to heaven. And those who are dead in Christ from earth to heaven is going to come back. That's the divine revelation from the Apostle Paul. Not the Apostle Ron Adema. If you got a problem with that, take it up with Paul. In the resurrection body, in his resurrection body, Jesus will return with those church age believers who are now in a state of being fallen asleep in Jesus. They will receive their bodies <clears throat> in from heaven. The body's not going to be less. The bodies are not going to come out of the grave. You know why? They've gone back to the dust of the earth. <laughs> they've gone back to the dust. Of, or, or if in the ocean, they've gone back to the, to the belly of a sea monster. Or if in fire, they've, gone, they've, gone, they've been consumed by, by the fire and gone back to the elements of, of, of their primary existence of the earth. My, my, my. We can get all this foolishness. Okay. Where are they? well, they're coming from there, and they're going to get the resurrection body from heaven. They're going to get the resurrection body from heaven. How many days was Je how many days was Jesus buried? On the fourth day, it does what? According to Lazarus, Four, fourth day it rots. He comes out in a, in a resurrection body. And we know where he came from. We know where he came out of. He didn't come out of the grave. He came out of Sheol. When they opened the tomb, there was nobody there. The angel said he's risen. That's the most unique part of the whole resurrection was the resurrection. This is why Jesus' resurrection is the first fruits of the resurrection. Your resurrection is not going to be like that. You're going to get a resurrection, but it won't be like his. I'm talking about the matter of fact, point one, point two, point three. Let's see. I mean, here, here's what Jesus said in John 14. I've gone, to prepare, to, I've gone to, to prepare a place for you. Right? We call it Hotel Heaven. Hotel Heaven. Uh, I got a room for you. On the way to Michigan, we needed to stop. But we ran out of energy. You know, you, know, you know why we stopped? We wanted to be asleep. What, what's, what, what, what is sleep for? It's for your soul? For your spirit? It's for your body. And how important to your body is deep sleep? <laughs> I mean, that's where your body really gets refueled. You know those nights where you've been in bed 12 hours and haven't slept and you get up tired and you went to bed? It's because you didn't get into deep sleep. You didn't shut your mind down. Man. What do I know? I know John 14. I uh, know John 14. God, he's going to prepare his hotel heaven for you. When you get there, you're going to be able to rest. You're going to be in a good rest position. What all that is, I don't know. Paul said, I was caught up 
I'm going to read it here in a moment. Let's just drop down. I, I'm running behind anyhow. No, I'm not. Let's see, 11.30. I'm running okay. Let's see. Let's look here. Let's look, let me look at point four. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 and 16, Paul revealed a doctrinal principle regarding the order of the first resurrection. <clears throat> Jesus first, church age believers second. And in the church age believers, there's two parts. There's the church age believers who have died, and there's church age believers who are alive. Right? There's two parts to the church age believers resurrection. Then you're going to have a dispensational order. Then you're going to have the Jewish age, the millennial age, etc. First, first, he says that he says this in first. It, you can read it in English. First Corinthians fifteen twenty through twenty three. <clears throat> Listen, this is why we say to you: Look, you got to come and sit down for a year with us. There's so much, and this is just basic doctrine. But listen, look, it's okay. Nobody's taught you. I, I was there. I've sat in that pew. Look, walk away hungry all the time. Never, never get fed. I understand that. But there's so much more to tell you. I mean, this is just it, this is 101. There's so much more to tell you. I, that I need to have you hang around for at least a year with us. So I would tell you more. The order of the first resurrection. See, we get in verse 15. For this I say to you by the word of the Lord, spirit, special revelation, the Paul's way of saying that, that a declarative doctrinal principle, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those, not precede those who have fallen asleep. So we have an order. But Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 15 as well. We have Jesus, the first fruits. You know, that's where he was raised on first fruits of the holiday. Then you have the church age believer. We have two units, then Jewish age, millennial age. In verse 16, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Protos. That means to receive their resurrection body. After that, in, in Paul, when Paul's talking about the resurrection of Christ and believers, he talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, he says, after that, Jesus appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Point five, the rapture of the church will be a day of surpassing greatness of revelation. I really found that interesting. That was Paul. Paul talks about it in the places where he talks about the second coming of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. <laughs> in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we'll all be changed. What's going to be changed? Not my soul, not my spirit, my body. I'm going to have space travel. Don't spend all your money ahead of time. <laughs> Listen, you go right out past the moon, the stars. You'll be able to wave to those in the capsules up there. Hey, man. They'll think, they'll think we're UFOs. We'll go through there. It'll be a pretty crowd of us, won't it? A pretty big crowd. They can't mess us out in outer space. We'll go right by them into the third heaven. The third heaven. <laughs> I'm looking for that day myself. We'll go by the capsules, the Russians and everybody else. <laughs> Waving that American flag. Having a chain with a cross on it. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, I know a man in Christ 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows such a man was caught up. Caught up to the third heaven. See, that's what happens to you when you die. And one day we're all going to be caught up without dying. <laughs> you having fun? No. I guess it's just, <laughs> I'm having fun. Caught up third heaven. 2 Corinthians 12, 4. Who was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words. 
which a man is not permitted to speak about. <laughs> Don't you know? You think that wasn't hard for a preacher? <laughs> huh? Maybe the only thing worse than that, inexpressible words would be a lady preacher, right? I mean, I don't know. Here's one in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 and 8. Because of the surpassing greatness of revelation. And he's talking about the second coming. For this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. How? Telling people about what he saw when he was caught up to third heaven. Man, everybody be going. You talk about space travel. <laughs> Exalting myself. And he said to me, my great, and you love this. Listen what he gave the earth. You know what he gave Paul? What a strange thing. Now we love it though, isn't it? My grace is sufficient. For power is perfected in weakness. Out of that being caught up and going to heaven is where that whole expression came from. When he came back. Can't tell anybody, Bill. What you, what you were permitted to speak, you can't speak about. It, you, you imagine how, how hard that was. Think how many times he ripped up paper. <laughs> Ooh, I'd like to write about this. Ooh. I can't, I just... There's things I can't tell you. Isn't that something? And boy, God made a point by putting a thorn in his flesh. All right. That's enough. Part one. <laughs>